Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you may sit in the world. Um, welcome to today's webinar on GE Bernova's 2024 predictions regarding APM. I'm Tracy Swartzen Druber, Vice President of Marketing for GE Bernova's digital business for power generation oil and gas. And joining me today are our, um, our, our panelists, Ryan Finger, uh, Vipin Nair and Fred Pickard. Ryan uh, hails from Washington, D.C. He is the Director of Software Product Marketing. He has three plus years of experience in enterprise software go-to-market experience with a focus on SaaS solutions. He has a master's degree in high-tech product digital, um, high-tech product and digital transformation and has experience in the with large financial institutions and energy companies. Fred comes to us from Boston. He is an engineering leader responsible for the full software portfolio development within our line of business. He's been within GE Digital since 2016 um, when his business, Nuco, which is an AI ML startup, was acquired by Digital's business. And Vipin Nair, while he's typically in Roanoke, Virginia, today he's coming to us from Bangalore, India. He is a senior director of product um, overseeing multiple applications within the APM portfolio. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me. So let's kick it off. We've got a lot of good predictions here. We're gonna talk about prediction number one, keeping current becomes top priority. Ryan, What's your experience with cloud and what's your de definition of it within the energy space as it um, pertains to keeping current? Yeah, so my experience, and, and again, um, thanks everybody for joining us. So my experience in cloud comes from, again, large banking um, industries. Um, so, and then also my master's. So keeping current, and the reason why cloud falls into the keeping current is in, in the scheme of energy with so many systems, so many legacy systems, so much new data coming on board, uh, what we hear and what we see and what we continue to see is organizations moving to the cloud, whether that's in a specific region, uh, data compliance used to be an issue, it's not so much anymore. So the experience that, that I have with the energy landscape and Vipin's gonna hit on this a little bit, is the reason customers are moving from on-prem and will continue to do so is just to have control and also third-party support over keeping current, right? So what we see and what I've seen in financial services is the issues arise around technical debt, performance, loss of performance, loss of productivity. So when organizations are looking to stay very lean on budgeting um, spend, especially around software, keeping current is a direct approach to help them get the most out of what they have, right? And so the, the vision and what we see continuing this year and heading even into 2025 is that cloud even if organizations have not done cloud before, um, they will start to look at cloud as a way to enable um, really more operational efficiency and agility. Yeah, so just Ryan, I would like to kind of quickly add a few points to it, right? So a few years back, I would say even if you consider, you know, go back five to six years back, our customers used to have heavily customized versions of our applications, right? So when we, the biggest challenge that we have seen with on-prem installation is uh, cust uh, the customers going for very customized solution and not able to have customer adoption. So over a period of time, they were un unable to have customer adoption and really uh, get the value out of the application. So as we talk to more of our customers, one of the main advantages that they do see moving to cloud is moving to a very standard solution, which if you look at it from an enterprise level is that easiest way to roll it out and make it similar across multiple sites, right? So one thing I do want to highlight, which where we have seen high value is better adoption and also the value realization of an application like asset performance management. So I would also say one of the barriers of uh, realizing value of an application is to have a very customized on-prem solution, which once installed, you really don't know whether you're to the latest of the spec, you will have performance issues, et cetera. So, you know, I can talk about hundreds of 
downstream effects of that. But one thing is standardization, which you can roll out to multiple sites and you see quicker value to realization there. Right? Just, uh, just want to add to that uh, aspect too on that element. And Excellent. one more thing, which I think, yeah. So Tracy, I would like to give some data points, uh, which where we are seeing prediction because your, uh, your prediction is true that we should be seeing the same momentum in the coming years also from a cloud migration perspective. So just if you look at from a G digital perspective, currently we do have 170 active customers using our application, which is not a uh, you know, small deal. And we, I'm talking about globally with two points of presence. And in fact, within that, if six to eight years back, it was just 90% of our customers was on on-premise and it was only 10%. Now we have seen such a major shift within the last couple of years. And even within that, we do have done at least five enterprise customers who have kind of converted to that. And, you know, please do remember the journey is never easy, but we do have a very standard solution of approaching the cloud migration, too, which is the key, right? It's not a lift and shift because you're getting an opportunity to review your business processes and make sure that you are taking this opportunity to move to cloud to, again, review your business processes and streamline it as much as possible. That's fantastic, Vipin. Um, I agree that the number of customers that we've seen moving to the cloud has been sort of a, a hockey stick, if you will, in terms of um, the interest and the acceleration. And I couldn't agree more that um, staying current and keeping current is possibly one of the greatest benefits, right? It's sort of say goodbye to upgrades. Um, you're, you're always going to be current. So that's excellent and uh, to see that momentum. Moving to prediction number two, um, no shocker here, right? Um, but AI will impact nearly every part of your business, right? Um, with the surge in chat GPT, AI became sort of the buzzword of 2023, but for 2024, we believe it's going to filter its way into every piece of the business. So Fred, as GE Vernova's engineering leader, Give us your thoughts on the state of AI today. Thanks, Tracy, and, and first, thanks for including me in today's panel. Um, as you mentioned in my intro, I've been involved in the machine learning space for close to 20 years, so I, I'll take the long view a bit here um, and and uh, emphasize, I think, what I've seen is, is and will expect to see going forward is the, the broadening of, of the people who are involved, who are going to touch this technology, this AI technology. When I um, started my journey, you know, the people who were involved with uh, this technology were specialists, uh, people with advanced degrees in topics like data science, machine vision, neural network modeling, and so forth. Um, what what I expect um, for my organization to start with that as an example in the next year or so, virtually everyone in my organization will touch this technology. Um, and uh, and I'll just give one example of why I think that is. One of our, and just about any product organization, I think, looks at uh, quality as uh, one of their key objectives. And quality, I think, as everyone knows, is, is a, is a cross-functional challenge. It, it normally affects every phase of the product development lifecycle, from requirements gathering to, in my case, software development, uh, to to quality assurance, to, to uh, customer support. Um, and there are really strong initiatives in each one of those phases where uh, AI assistance, I think with a focus on quality will really change the way that we, that we, we pursue quality going forward from a so in a software organization. And again, I would expect that to generalize very uh, smoothly to many product development organizations. Um, so again, just about everyone, people with titles like again, quality analyst or uh, customer support specialist, all of those folks, I think my prediction will be to, will uh, interact with this technology either directly or indirectly through uh, you know embedded software capabilities. So all of our vendors, primary vendors, are embedding AI in their solutions. We'll take advantage of that. Of course, we embed AI within our solutions in APM. We have a long experience with. Uh, of course, tools like Smart Signal, which are which are uh, machine learning based, and 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 products that uh, you know have, have have been incorporated in our portfolio. I think Vivian's going to talk 
next, I think more specifically about some of our applications. But my expectation, again, just from the WHO perspective is that we're going to see a huge broadening, you know, in terms of uh, the people who, who touch this technology. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. I think that's a solid prediction. So Vip, and as, as Fred said, you know, we're, we're interested to get your um, perspective on AI specific to APM and how you see this trend um, really impacting the energy sector. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, uh, you know, uh, Fred did kind of uh, touch up on it brilliantly. So if you ask me a couple of years back, you know, we were thinking of use cases, how to deploy AI. Now things, tables have changed because now we see a lot of influx of unstructured data. For example, customers using more mobile devices, right? Through which we are getting a lot of images. Uh, we have to connect to more data sources uh, for multiple reasons, for new product lines. And the ability to kind of look at the data quality, that's one and another element of it. So we are seeing a change, a transition for which we have to use AI to be more efficient in a way, right? So I think there is a reason it's, and technology is more of an enabler, right? So we are seeing trends which where we will have to deploy AI to be really be efficient in a way. So to Fred's point, few of the use cases that we have seen in the recent past, I would say is computer vision. I would like to start with that. That's one of my favorites because it touches uh, my core product line, which is integrity to a large extent. Uh, as you're aware, from an inspection perspective, uh, we are seeing a, a, a surge in robotic inspections, a surge in mobile devices, but all of these generate unstructured data like uh, you know images and videos. And one of the use cases that our team have kind of started to work on is called image analytics, where we do have the capability to kind of look at an image and look at uh, define the defect mode or a damage mode and also go one step ahead, classify it, right? Because only if you can classify it, you can take an action. So, you know, we will see a lot of AI solution who can predict what is the damage mode, but I think the, the beauty of embedding it into APM is that we can really close the loop. We can identify it, we can classify it based on our uh, domain expertise, and then finally uh, come up with a recommendation which is what ends the loop. So as long, I, I always believe if you're not able to kind of get into a recommendation mode, which connects to your EAM systems where you can take action on it, I mean, it's of no use. So Tracy, to your point, that's one of a very classic example. And we are seeing uh, a lot of interest and we would like to, you know, we'll be putting more efforts into it in the coming years. The next is data quality. Uh, the, when you look at asset performance management, the backbone of it, be it bad actors, identification of bad actors, uh, it all depends on the quality of the data that we ingest from other sources, be it IT or OT, like the EAM work history data. And uh, I think we'll soon touch about our, about our carbon uh, management software. But even as, a, as we start developing these uh, other application, we have to exist in an ecosystem which needs to connect to multiple data sources, which is disparate in nature. And if you don't have AI enabled to look at the data set and figure out which is the bad data, it is going to be, a, you know, again, bad analysis and bad recommendation so forth in the, the downstream of it. So I don't see AI is going to kind of remove a, a persona. It's just going to improve the efficiency of the existing work that we need to do, considering the amount of unstructured data that is coming into the privacy, right? So yeah, that's something which I, I kind of, I wanted to point out two cases. I can go with the third one, which is recommendation generation. So one of the uh, core portfolio of APM is recommendation generation, which is you know uh, predictive in nature, which is manual recommendation. But one other aspect which our smart signal or predictive analytics team work, is working on is prescriptive maintenance, which is another use case for say generative AI. So our team is actively working on not only stopping at alerts and uh, based on the predictive analytics, but kind of coming to the next step on recommending the rec uh, what needs to be done based on the alert that is we are observing. So it's again a use case for generative AI that we are already looking in. Uh, and the fourth one is not directly into the product, 
But if you look at the life cycle, one of the places where our customer interact the most is the support and the product documentation. So we are looking at a, a boat, which is generative AI driven boat as a proof of concept, which can look into the product documentation, the previous knowledge based articles and help our customers to get into the solution much faster and quicker. Today it takes say, say 10 days. Now uh, we can kind of reduce it maybe by 50 to 60% by applying that from a customer experience perspective on a support documentation. So, I mean, the use cases and the avenues are a lot and it is real uh, value adding use cases if you may Tracy on that. That's awesome. Yeah, I wouldn't say that. Oh, I was gonna, yeah, sorry, sorry, Ryan. I was, I was just gonna say quickly. Um, reminder to everyone: uh, Q and A is open. Please put any questions that you have in the chat. I'm gonna let Ryan jump in. I know Ryan's got something to add to, <clears throat> to what Vipin has to say, but uh, again, just a reminder: please um, enter your uh, Q and A in the chat. We want to hear from you. That's the, that's the fun part of doing this live. Um, so my, my one bold prediction on top of this, right? Everyone's hearing a lot about AI ML. We have Fred who, who's an expert in it. We have Vipin who's looking out integrates in the portfolio. Um, the, my big prediction on this for 2024, it's gonna be in, in the coming years, the end of the term industry 4.0, industry 5.0, autonomous enterprise. There's been verticals, other industries, I'll keep going back to banking, who have pushed a vision of, hey, we can fully automate these processes, take the control out of your hands, reduce risk, reduce cost. In almost every single one of those industries, that promise has not come to fruition. So when you think about AI, right, still it's very much so how you amplify human experience and potential because we've seen these trends, we've seen these reports, we've seen this huge robust vision for flying cars in 2050, right? So the, the big prediction I have is some of these terms are really, are really gonna start to rein back in and get back to the basics of the usage of AI ML because there's very tangible outcomes that can be delivered that sometimes get missed with this big vision of autonomous enterprise. So I will say watch out for a change or a slight detract from that vision um, as we go through the, these new technologies. But Ryan, I would offer the counterpoint. I mean, I get excited when I think about, when you talk about the tangible, right? And what Vipin just spoke to, right? Of being able to literally um, uh, not only just, just to, to catalog and classify, right? 10,000 images, if you will, like that. That, that has some incredible promise, not only of the efficiency, right, but the time to data, the time to action, right? And to allow the expertise that is within the industry to do what they do best, and that is solve problems, to mitigate risks, to get ahead, to see ahead, right, versus sort of the mundane. So I get really excited when I see those tangible use cases um, that we're talking about. And and uh, we do have a question. I'm gonna interrupt the into the next prediction because this one's perfect for right now. And, and that is the question um, of besides the support chat bot, what was the other LLM based project or feature Vipin that you um, spoke to just as a reminder? Yeah, I, I would say uh, one is a chatbot uh, for the la uh, the large language models, but we are also evaluating that for the recommendation, prescriptive recommendation generation based on the previous history. Or even you can look at, say, the root cause analysis when you're generating it. So based on the previous analysis that we have done, we are trying to kind of generate it. So again, these are some of the proof of concept that we are evaluating based on the LLM-based uh, projects or the AI model itself. I don't know, Fred, if there's anything else yeah. that I'm not aware of, but engineering is looking into it actively, yeah, yeah. No, those, those are the big ones, so that's a good point, Vipin. And, and just to kind of layer maybe quickly on top of that, I mean, the reason that we're able to take this, you know, leverage this technology in, in, those, uh, in those spots are the incredible kind of data set that we have available to us. Everybody knows that these, uh, these technologies, most of the AI technology we're talking about are really uh, only as good as the data that you put into them. Um, and so with a, with a product like APM, you know, with, with its long history, again, it, many different, you know, components of it, we have an incredible database that we can, that we can build from. 
Um, you mentioned a couple examples of that, the product mock documentation, again, which has evolved over over many years and, and uh, you know, it's, it's quite extensive. The, our, our support calls are, you know, there's, there's just a huge uh, data set that we can mine for insight. And uh, so I, you mentioned two quick applications. There's some others that are in development that maybe we don't want to talk too much about right now today, but, but I just want to kind of highlight what is it that's enabling it. It's, it's really the, the data set that we have available to us, which has been built up again over a significant number of years. So. Excellent, great insights. I'm gonna march ahead to prediction number three and yeah, he said it folks, this comes directly from Ryan, the recognition of rogue software. So Ryan, it's a charged word, rogue, what does that mean? What's what's your <laughs> idea, right? Yeah, so that's the fun, that the fun, from? yeah, that's the fun word to kind of put some urgency behind. And, and, and my big prediction here is if we're gonna see in 2024 and forward, really a, a, a bigger restructuring around how organizations manage software, manage vendors, manage development. Um, so right now what we see, and with all this emerging awesome technology, right, that we can talk about all day, um, and it, it plays back in the cloud, it plays back into AI, right? This new environment and those trends open up the potential for what I refer to as rogue development, right? Um, Fred might chime in and call it something different, but when you think about the scale of the energy organizations and use Zipman's example of a large company leveraging the cloud. Let's say they have upstream, midstream and downstream, right? The beauty of cloud is it provides flexibility. Um, whether you're working in an AWS or an Azure or Google or a private cloud, it provides you the flexibility to have your data scientists, your AI specialists um, go in and produce things to help your company, which is great, right? When I get into Rogue is when you look at the energy organizations, you have a customer leveraging, let's say, a vendor upstream and downstream of developing their own application. At some point in the future, that the, the rubber is going to meet the road, for lack of a better term, and IT, OT, operations, maybe all the way up to the VP level is going to say, how are we spending so much on software? We have vendors, we're using our own cloud spend, and we have all these applications. What that leads to, although great for innovation, companies over the past few years as emerging tech have let it go slightly off the rails, <laughs> maybe not fully, but the, the concept of rogue software really gets into the idea of the technical debt, the best engineering practices, which Fred could talk about, right? Um, your data security, um, do you have the internal expertise to build an application that's fit for purpose? So this all plays back to that concept of technical debt, which cloud helps get rid of by staying current but it also enables the potential that your organization is spending way more on development than you thought. Um, so the, that, that to me is a big one as you look at energy organizations becoming way more digital, or I guess any asset in, intensive organization, that this is eventually gonna get reined in to where IT and OT are gonna have to be way more tied together um, to make sure that they're not opening up their company to potential data risks or increased spend and anything along those lines. So it's happened before, again, just to keep using banking, it happens. Um, and then when you take a look at the actual financial impact, <laughs> some of those constraints start coming into play, which makes it really important for a business case, adoption to Vipin's point, right? And really having a, a solutions that are scalable and enjoyed by the bulk of your organization to help limit um, some of that development. No, yeah, that's I think you hit on really good Go insight. Ahead, I was gonna, I was gonna ask you, Fred, to jump in. You know, as the engineering leader, what, what sort of trends and what are you seeing that can help address, address this? Yeah, first, first to Ryan's problem statement. I think we've, we felt the pain of that. To be quite frank, you know, um, and again, this is not just local to our business, but uh, you know, Vernova wide. I'm, I'm tied in with some of the. Uh, efforts that we're we're trying to use to combat this this issue, um, and one of the main ones, the basic approach, I think, is really um, having a, a center of excellence, a, a core function that is, especially when we're talking about uh, cloud and AI in particular, cloud maybe primarily. Um, you know, the business model, to be quite frank, of of the hyperscalers is is to make this as low friction as possible. And that's with uh, the adoption of of cloud technologies. So that's their that's their approach to the market, of course. Um, and so what, what we need to do as consumers, uh, both in terms of internal applications and in terms of our SaaS product set, um, is, to, is to balance that 
with with a, a process. And again, one of, one of our key approaches has been to establish a center of excellence that um, it takes care of everything as as kind of fundamental as the tagging of new uh, cloud accounts to uh, to the tracking, you know, making sure that there are owners associated with those accounts, tracking costs. Of course, we need, we have centralized dashboards that helps keep an eye, uh, both uh, kind of all levels of the organization to keep an eye on on costs, especially around, uh, you know, these very compute intensive uh, newer applications that can very, very easily in a very short period of time, um, you know, run your bill, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, to, to, a, to a level that's not sustainable, clearly. So, um, so I do, I do think it's uh, a lot of the techniques that we're using are fairly basic. They're organizational as well as technical. Um, and again, we, we, have a, we have a center of excellence that we call our foundation services team in the engineering organization that is, that is chartered to, uh, to solve this particular problem. So um, I, I think if I had to you know, give one recommendation or I suppose a prediction, it's um, most organizations will, I think, eventually end up with a, with a center of excellence, whatever you end, end up calling it, that has this, has this as part of its uh, key mission statement. That's really good, Fred. Um, I'm going to address one of the questions um, while we've got time here. We're doing really, really good on time. Um, in terms of, there's a question, and I'm going to I'm going to allow it. I'm going to open up to all three of you, whoever wants to jump in um, first. And that was, um, you know, the the question is, there's a perception of the energy sector being behind in cloud adoption. Why? Why might that be, or or is that true? Number one, and and if if so, why might that be? Who would like to take that? Well, I'll do a general uh, pass on that quick, and I'm sure Vipin, from your first data points, you can probably expand on it. Um, so, for the energy industry, when you look at the way, and I think Fred also hit on a little. This is the, the great part about predictions, right? You start to see these all stack up, and it's going to create this thing that needs to be we think needs to be dealt with. Um, so when you look at the energy industry, I think part of it, again, reverting back to other industries is the internal understanding and expertise around cloud technology. That's part of it. Um, the, the, the battle for talent in cloud right now is unlike any other time, um, similar to AI, folks who work in AI. So part of this switch and the push to digitization is one, I think the understanding and staffing around being able to support cloud projects um, the other piece of this that I think everyone is very familiar with is the data compliance and regulatory concerns that still stand with cloud. Although that is being handled and a lot of these providers, including ourselves, have our own security standards in place for producers of energy, whether it's oil and gas or power generation, um, it's just that inherent risk of having that in the cloud, right? So <laughs> there's still a hurdle to overcome. I know a lot of these hyperscalers and ourselves are working on the compliance required to get customers comfortable, but one is the staffing and being able to compete and get that talent in house to do this really, really well. And then the second I would say um, falls into the, that, that other piece, which would be, um, yeah, I'll stop there. Vipin, any, uh, uh, anything to add or, or even Fred? Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I just I'll, I'll just add. To, so one is definitely the security, which we continues to you know improve every year, right? That's that's given. But I, I from a business perspective, my, I've seen customers worrying uh, that the it, cloud will take away the freedom to configure workflows. It's always the freedom that they get uh, once they're in an on-prem customers. But as I said, data is speaking otherwise. We have customers uh, with say six to seven sites across the globe who have been uh, on-premise customer for 13 years have gone live with our cloud solution. But the key is to understand the requirement uh, work. And again, it's not a lift and shift. There is, it's a journey. The cloud migration is a path where we have to work together and we have to partner with the customer to understand the requirements and configure it. Because now we are not talking about VB rules. We are talking about other capabilities like configurations that we can do in cloud, which is different, but it can be done. So it's, it's a partnership and we have to give the confidence to the customer and we have to do it together. So just, just want to add that element to it, giving the confidence to the customer and it's a joint, it's a joint partnership between us and the uh, customer in that case. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, on the cyber side, I just wanted to chime in. I think, I think another question just came in. I think there is a perception that is changing um, that, that cloud uh, security is, is, 
you know, has historically had its problems. You know, we, we hear about, again, a few high profile incidents. Um, I, th I think my perception is, is that um, due to the standardization of technology stacks that is kind of implied in many ways by, by cloud migrations, the long term prospect is that actually cloud security will be uh, will, will far exceed what we what we see on prem. The problem with on prem is that you just have such a variance, such variety, I think, of, of tech stacks, technologies, to be honest, people, you know, uh, you can't can't miss that aspect of it as well. That um, that in the long term, I think the vulnerabilities there um, will, you know, will prove out to be to be um, uh, you know to be to be significant. I think in the cloud space, as we get to standardization of tech stacks and and uh, and again standardization of, of knowledge bases around that, you'll see. I think um, uh, that perception is is already changing, and I think it it'll continue to change. Really well-rounded uh, assessment of, of the questions in this prediction. So this is excellent. I don't think we could have timed it any better. We are halfway through our predictions and, and halfway through our time together. And so heading on to prediction number four, this is a really interesting one and an absolute thing that we're going to see more of, and that is that energy organizations will struggle with new data sources. And this has everything to do with, it's almost daily, there's a new alert about M&A activity within the, uh, within the oil and gas uh, sector with new expansions, right? Um, of deploying renewables, regardless of who you are within the energy ecosystem, even mining, right, is deploying renewables at unprecedented rates. So what does that mean, right? What does that mean, Vipin, when you look at the industry today, what's causing you to see this, uh, this trend? Yeah, so uh, definitely, I mean, uh, we are talking with uh, energy transition, as you correctly put uh, Tracy on that, which also brings in the, re uh, the reason to connect to different data sources too, right? So we uh, we touched upon it as a part of uh, cloud too, and to be a, you know, if, and also the other thing which I really think is that it's becoming an uh, ecosystem. We, we live in an ecosystem where not only one application, we need to be integrated with multiple applications in general. So uh, with, one of the things which we are seeing a lot of is the ability to connect to multiple data sources. Earlier it was just say the IT and the OT, but now we are seeing a lot of new AI solutions which we need to connect to, uh, data lakes that we need to connect to, uh, sensors, uh, the predictive analytics sensors that we need to connect to. Overall, it is becoming a requirement every time that we get, uh, you know, when we talk to a customer, so which was not the case few years back. So which leads that we need to have a better way of integrating with all these data sources. And one of the things that our connect team and our engineering team continues to work on is how easily we can connect to other data sources using say APIs. And I let, uh, I know this is uh, near and dear to Ryan too, but I, I would say the trend is that we are a part of a bigger ecosystem and we cannot just sustain as a, just an independent application there. Yeah, definitely. And I'll, I'll take that a step up. And obviously as the product leader written for APM, I think that that data context is really important. So take it a, a level higher than that, um, maybe to the enterprise level. Um, to Tracy's point, uh, we see every day and we listen to the market every day of organizations either doing M&A activities, bringing on new asset types, right? Trying to meet the energy transition in certain ways. It's important to remember that a lot of these times or in any organization, when you do an M&A activity, you could be in the customer relationship management market like Salesforce and Adobe, right? You could be in the ERP market. When you're doing acquisitions, especially of another company, you're really paying for data, the customers and the technology that comes along with that, right? So when these organizations that what we're going to keep seeing are undergoing these M&A activities, yes, there's always a part of that, which is looking at the data, the structure, how the system's lined up, doing a company to company audit. There's still going to be issues um, that arise as these organizations look to invest, right? So you think about a traditional oil and gas company purchasing a renewables company. What they're going to want to figure out pretty much as fast as possible is how do we get that data into where the rest of our data is? How do we contextualize this new data? 
what does this data mean to how we operate now versus how we did before, right? So getting that data through the door into a central system, getting your users familiar with the data and what it means to your productivity as a company is gonna be very important um, because the slower it takes you to get that data on board in, the longer it's gonna take for you to see return from that M&A activity, right? Or your investments in renewable assets. So the, the struggle that's gonna be here is one, the understanding of how these systems need to talk to, talk to each other. Um, it's going to be the understanding of where that data fits in to your overall KPIs. Um, so it's going to be different for every company and different based on the investment. And then also, how do we, within the composability piece here, is how do we better visualize this data to have actionable outcomes as fast as possible? Um, and that's for everything. So really, that's going to be the struggle um, within these activities is finding the right internal expertise, service expertise, um, maybe system integrators expertise to get this data to a point that you want it so that you can work more efficiently. So we'll see that happening more and more as companies begin to conglomerate and even new energy sources come online. Yeah, maybe I can just add, add on top of that scenario that Ryan just painted, I think very well the, you know, in addition to the acquisition scenario, one thing we're seeing, I think, is the, the need, the demand to have uh, data sharing across organizational boundaries. And so uh, maybe the most obvious example that we have in our new product set is in the carbon management series space, where, um, you know, scope three emissions data, uh, the expectation is in many, you know, geographies around the world that uh, that data is going to be shared across organizational boundaries. You're going to need to be able to um, uh, uh, provide and both be a source and a consumer of, of uh, that type of, of emissions data. Um, and that's one of the Core challenges that we're that we're addressing with uh, Series product, um, and uh, I think that's only going to accelerate. Would be my expectation. Again, emissions data is just one one strong example where um, you know the, the the entire supply chain, if you will, kind of behind these organizations is 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 going to need to be, have some degree of visibility. Of course, there's you know there's uh, there's all kinds of challenges with that, both technical and. Um, in terms of kind of uh, uh, intellectual property, but but I, I do believe that um, you know that, that trend is not going to slow down. It's only going to accelerate. Again, in the short term, I think the, the place where we're seeing it the most directly is in the is in the uh, carbon management space. Yeah, and I would tie this back again, just to these the other three trends, right? The cloud, the AI, and kind of this software development aspect is. The, the way companies can help get this data onboarded and contextualized faster is through the use of these technologies, right? So this isn't, these predictions aren't living in a silo. Um, we, we already see it happen with ERP, EAM data, right? We see it now more in oil and gas for ODSU data, the hierarchy type for offshore. Um, we see it now with integrating weather data, right? So there's all this unstructured data to Vipin's point. And then it's how do you use the technology to overcome this hurdle and how do you use the expertise at your disposal to overcome it? And I think that's going to be a big learning curve for organizations undergoing this. Um, so technology definitely can support it, but it's also that internal oper operationalization of doing so. So how does that technology amplify your ability to use this data the best way possible? And I think Fred nailed it with the carbon piece, right? It's bringing that carbon data into context with everything you do and keeping that top of mind with, with everything else you have going on. And, um, we'll, we'll see some issues with that as we go go through the year. Really good thoughts, and and let's uh, let's continue, Ryan, with you as we roll into prediction number five, and that is, you know, we've we've talked a lot about right software and cloud and AI, but now we want to get into the hum human component, right? So the prediction is that we're going to maintain and not forget about the human component in operations. So what what does that mean to you in context of what all we've we've just discussed? Yeah, definitely. It, it comes back to the expertise that quite honestly takes some of this technology a long time to gather on its own, right? AI ML gets smarter as it goes. Uh, the more data you collect, the more decisions that you can make. We, we are very aware, and I think the whole industry is very aware that you have internal expertise that if you lose them, your, your operation is going to feel the impact of that, right? So when we look at technology and how it fits in energy, it hits on a few areas. One is amplifying human human potential. I think that's the big one, is how can we align and get current organizations 
into the cloud, leveraging models, um, great user experience, um, show a clear value on how it aligns to their job and their outcomes. So one is really around the amplification of, of the human experience. The second, I think also energy organizations look at the next few years or even the next five years, when you look at some of the, the change in workforce and change of who's your employee base, um, they're really gonna be focused coming in on is there technology here to help me? Is it going to make me better at my job? And can I, is it usable? So we're not going to go to this full autonomous enterprise. Um, energy employees, energy organizations will require manual intervention, even more so than any other industry, right? I, I can't even use banking as an example this time because you file a loan, right? You have a little bot that helps you push the loan along. It tells you to fill out the form. Um, in energy, you can't do that. There, there's always going to need to be an element of human to human contact communication and also human to asset contact. So layering in this technology really needs to focus on making those experiences better rather than taking those experiences away. No, I think that's spot on. Vipin, wh what do you have to say about, about this? And, and do you think there's a future where, where AI could ever take your job? <laughs> No, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, so I, I think I want to share a, a, a statistics, which is as per the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, which which is pretty interesting when you you know look at from a lens of uh, oil and gas or manufacturing for that matter, which is uh, you know the med the tenure the median tenure for an uh, employee which is who's aged between 25 to 34 years, which is, you know, which is the primary workforce, ETS, Tracy, right? And uh, I would say that it's not even one complete turnaround or a shutdown. So, uh, you know, that they are not there to even see a complete equipment uh, opened up during that tenure, which, and for, and, uh, you know, if you, few decades back, this tenure was almost 10 to 12 years, which means that they were there physically to see the equipments opened up, see how, understand how it used to be, right? So there is, again, I'm connecting it back to the AI use cases that because of this churn in this workforce with this, this uh, you know, uh, the younger workforce, it is imperative that we provide them with data that they can look at, visualize and understand if there is a turnaround coming up because they are not able to attend and visualize it. So that's why mobility, so I just want to kind of, uh, the prediction is we will have customers in every domain uh, adopting mobile solution. So we used to see the trend only with operators, but now we are seeing more maintenance engineers picking up mobile solution, integrity users picking up uh, mobile solution, just because they want a standard template to follow and capture the result during turnarounds. Earlier, it used to be written or somewhere in somebody's brain, right? That was a tribal knowledge. So there is an imperative that uh, organization needs to convert to a standard way and only way to standardize data collection is become mobile. Right. That's one use case. Second is the ability to visualize a, a equipment in a 3D, visual, 3D perspective or even in a 2D perspective, depending on the use case. What what does that help you? Right. Uh, five years back, it was more of an eye candy. But now, as I said, 3D visualization completes that definition of a digital twin where you are able to visualize it, visualize how the equipment looks like, even the internals of it to understand the damage mechanism exactly the same way, right? So that when you're out in the field, you really know where to inspect, what to inspect, how to inspect, and also the historical information related to that asset. So I, I just wanted to call out a few of the use cases, which was more of, more of optional a few years back, mobile or a 3D visualization, how it is really critical when it comes to the, the, the attrition or the, the the churn in the workforce itself. So, and the, the third one is AI, I can talk about that. So I'm again, connecting, nothing is uh, independent of each other, right? Mobility, visualize, contextual visualization, and finally, AI, generative AI, which can recommend what needs to be done to this uh, workforce. It's again, uh, the third use case. So I, I definitely do not think AI is going to replace jobs but it'll help improve the efficiency of the younger workforce, which is kind of, uh, there is a churn in that. And finally improve the safety, right? Why do we have to do it? We cannot take chances with process industries. We cannot, right? So it all, we all do asset performance management finally to improve the reliability and also the safety. 
So we have to ensure that even if we are sending a, a, a user with three years experience, we have to fully equip uh, that employee the best we can. And we have to use technology for that purpose. Yeah, I think that's a great point. That my last note on that, that this so software maintain maintain the human component. You'll see a lot. Hey, three hundred percent ROI, right? Um, you, you're selling a software for maybe maybe a little bit cheaper that gives X, right? The the maintain the human component, and, and we understand financials. We understand financials are important. However, um, the risk, the safety, um, the comfortable ex the customer ex or employee experience. I, I apologize are all still very critical in using software, right? Yes, we want to help produce more energy. We want to help produce more reliable energy, sustainable energy. That's perfect. But if you don't give your, your employees an ecosystem where they feel comfortable, feel efficient, feel effective, feel appreciated, um, you're, you're not going to hit those goals with, the, with those rates that Vipin just mentioned between two and a half and three and a half years, right? So software is a lens for this where it is a, a factor that, people will take very seriously is how your tech environment works when joining, because that's going to impact all those things that Pippin mentioned, right? So um, just another tangential effect, maybe it's not tangential, super important effects of software, um, along with all the fun return on investment, decreased time to value, all, all of that. Maybe I can just chime in quickly here. I think, I think uh, you know, just to come back to the AI topic again a little bit here and, and the interaction between the AI system and the humans, I think the, the places where we've seen false starts, if you will, kind of in this, uh, in some of these applications is our, and, and some of these, of course, have, have been in the news, um, are places where the AI system doesn't make the context available to the human sufficiently. And so maybe makes a recommendation, but doesn't provide the citation, the reference, the backup material. That's where I think we tend to run into trouble. Um, and so I think, you know, one of the things we're heavily focused on in all of the I think we're, work we're doing is making sure that that interface, if you will, between the the, the recommending engine, whatever you would like to call it, and, uh, and the and the user is uh, is as robust as possible, because uh, again, that's where I think sometimes people people do run into trouble. You know, the, again, some of the famous cases that have been in the news from the legal domain, where cases have been, you know, kind of uh, you know, kind of the, the system has made them up out of whole cloth, has cite, cited, you know. Uh, you know, invalid or kind of constructed uh, legal cases is just, you know, one kind of uh, red example where, where that's the case. Again, I, I think the main, the main from an engineering point of view, the main uh, kind of caution there, I think, is, uh, yes, you want to try to make the, the system as intelligent as, as uh, uh, provide the best information possible, but providing that additional context, um, I think, is, is one of the things that will make the, make the adoption of this, uh, this technology much more uh, robust and long lasting. Brad, I, I could not agree more with the, your, your comment about context. And I think it really does play into, you still have to have a human validating and, and making those decisions and saying, is this truly given, given my situational awareness, the right thing to do, right? Because we are exactly. in a, in an industry where um, someone recently said to me, and I said, that was perfectly right there. In many cases, there are no do-overs. We don't get that second chance. You've got to nail it the first time, which I think is, is really interesting to think about how AI can help make better decisions, but by no means are, are we eliminating the human component of things. So speaking of humans, this brings us to our final prediction. And this is our bonus prediction, and that is that we will see many of you humans at our customer event um, this coming April in Houston. We're calling it Transform to Transition. And as you can imagine, we are focused on not only digital transformation, but how it is accelerating the energy transition. Um, we have a QR code here. If, if you are not already pre-registered, we invite you to pre-register. We're looking forward to opening up uh, full registration very soon. Any any of you wish to speak about what you're looking forward to in Houston, or or pulling together all of these uh, um, these uh, what may have seemed as disparate predictions and tying them together? Anyone want to give a shot at that? Perhaps Ryan. Yeah, so luckily I've been fortunate to work with a lot of uh, customers that are coming to Houston to present and. 
What I'm really looking forward to is you're going to hear a lot in this around cloud migration, um, around the use of emerging technology, around the use of um, predictive analytics, right? We're, you're going to hear everything from start to finish. You're going to hear adoption stories. So when you think about these five trends that tie it all back together, we have some great examples of enterprise customers going to cloud, enterprise customers leveraging, whether it's our AI ML or our AI ML alongside another AI um, to actually perform workloads. You're going to hear a lot about um, user stories and how software is helping them work better, right? Whether that's Rounds Pro or other mobile applications. So there are bits and pieces of these predictions and why we piece these predictions together that are already happening. Um, maybe not at the scale that might be required, but we are seeing some very early adopters of, of technology starting to take these steps. So these trends are really wrapped around the idea that some of these things are happening and if you're an organization who wants to learn from a different industry, a different use case, um, just hear how people are uniquely using this technology, uh, Houston will be a great time to do so. And I know Vipin will be there, um, obviously, as the product expert, but that's how it all ties together. And, and that's where we're taking our customers in this journey, um, is it, really helping them piece together the right solution for the outcomes that they need. Vipin, anything you'd like to add? Uh, no, I, I would say that, you know, we'll have separate streams for each, so uh, tracks of it, be it uh, a health track, integrity track, safety track, there's so much to talk about it, right? It's not just one because APM is, a, you know, a, a bigger solution set, but we will focus on individual product lines and we'll have uh, most of our product managers ready to show, uh, you know, showcase what we have been working on diligently in the past two years, including uh, the latest version, which is V5 uh, in cloud. So yeah, we, we are excited for April and, you know, we hope to see everyone there. So that's all from my end, Tracy, so. And Fred, I'll let you weigh in on, uh, on your prediction around Houston. Yeah, I think, you know, just like with any, uh, you know, get together of this type. I think what I'm really looking forward to is kind of the back and forth. Again, the, these webinars are great, but they, they tend to be, you know, mostly a kind of one directional. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, the event like Houston will, I think uh, my prediction will be, will be, you know, much more uh, interactive and we'll, we'll have the ability to kind of, uh, you know, feed ideas, ideas back and forth. So that's what I'm looking forward to. Excellent. And I, I do have one final question in the in the chat right now, and I'm gonna kick it to you, Fred, and that is, how are you thinking about ways to check AI, specifically the um, LLMs? Um, how are you gonna check those automatically? Um, the, the context is it's great enriching answers with citations, but current um, generative LLMs uh, will still happily hallucinate and then list um, list accompanying citations. Um, so do you want to give some thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a whole range of techniques, great question, that uh, you know that people are, not just us, of course, are investigating there. One of the main ones, maybe I'll, I'll cite is, uh, and what I meant by context was um, a confidence factor, I think, uh, a recommendation confidence factor in, you know, in the LLM space, I think it's going to be a critical kind of uh, component to this to kind of allow the human and the human will always be in a loop, I think, to the question uh, it, for me and the foresee for the foreseeable future when we're talking about LLM applications. Um, so, but giving the human, you know, some high level view of kind of what the degree of confidence that the machine has is in the recommendation that it's making is just, I'm just giving that as one example, but an important one, I think, um, as a technique to, uh, again, to, to, to make sure that that contextual information is being shared. Um, because I think citations, as you, as I mentioned earlier, is, is a, just one more example of that. Um, so, so I think allowing the, having the machine essentially, the application be able to share the rationale behind its recommendation in, in many forms. Again, confidence factors, citations. There's a whole range of those. Uh, I think are important. The other thing, of course, in GE that we're lucky to be able to take advantage of is uh, we have a whole set of domain experts that can uh, review recommendations. Um, for their, uh, you know, degree of hallucination, if you want to call it that. Um, and so there's a kind of a natural feedback loop that we're able to, luckily with our Vanova partners, take advantage of to improve uh, the quality of, of what we are able to put out there. So um, so I think, you know, it's, it's, it's not a simple answer. I think there's a whole range of 
technology, not one silver bullet, I would say, in terms of the uh, that the problem that the questioner is, is highlighting. But but I think we you know we we've we've got some really interesting I think techniques that we're exploring. I think it'll be the combination of those factors that'll lead to increased credibility. Excellent. Thanks for that answer. And and Ryan, just. At the nick of time, I'll, I'll give you two minutes to answer this one coming in. Any news on um, GE Power within APM? It says energy sector utilities. So I'm going to let you sort of interpret what that question might be asking, but uh, you want to give it a go? Yeah, I'm happy to take uh, follow-ups as well. So on that, our APM, we are using it across uh, utilities, right? So if you think about, so we have, a, uh, I see a new question pop up. So we have our grid business, right? That does derms and some other distribution side of the software, right? That's the beauty of being one Vernova. So digital grid does derms. They do some other things across uh, utilities. Where we fall into utilities is the APM behind T and D access, tr uh, transmission and distribution. Um, we support that across utilities. We are also working currently with vertically integrated utilities in the US, Europe and parts of Africa. Um, with a solution called fleet orchestration, um, which is really helping them to determine um, the right energy mix in the market um, based on peak demand. So we are doing work across utilities in a few different areas. The fleet orc is a very specific example for energy traders to really help amplify how they do their job effectively. Like Tracy said, you only really get one chance, right? Let's get them the data to make the right choices with their expertise. And again, um, for anything APM, we talked about it, the composability piece and the use of technology and onboarding new assets, we are working actively in the utility side. Um, t and is really where we will fall in that um, because we do partner closely with our grid digital business um, across the whole ecosystem. So you'll see bits and pieces of Vernova software pop up, whether it's DERMS or what have you alongside of our APM. Excellent. Well, we are right at time. I so want to thank you, Fred, Vipin, Ryan, for your time uh, this morning. And more importantly, I want to thank those of you who have um, blessed us with your time. I hope this was interesting, maybe a bit entertaining. And as Ryan said, reach out um, in any way you see fit um, through the web, through social media channels. Um, we're happy to engage with you, and we hope to see you in Houston uh, later this year. Thank you.